Hi everybody, welcome back to After Chat. This is episode number three. We have a template. We don't really have a template. That's just what I wrote down as the title for the uh, episode. Oh, that is the title. Right. That, that actually is the title. Uh, episode yeah. one was titled, insert title here. Episode two was called Working Title. These are things you did not even realize that were, that's why they're, you'll notice uh, in our list, episodes four through infinity don't have any titles because I haven't made them up yet. Shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. So, we're back here for week number three and we're gonna jump right into some news. There's actually been some interesting things that have been going on in the camera world. A photographer in Brooklyn made $15,000 in a single day selling prints on Instagram. Damn. Yeah. Uh, Brooklyn-based photographer Daniel Arnold all but proved that this a couple of days ago when he made over $15,000 selling prints on Instagram in a single day. With no idea how to pay his rent for the next month or his studio space, uh, he took to his rather large Instagram following. I th it, they said it was like 28,000, 29,000 followers. That's, I'm sure it's more now. It's, it's got to be a lot more now. And told him they could order one 4x6 print of anything in his Instagram hi history for $150, signed and shipped to them. 150 bucks, one four by six print. Yeah. Does Instagram take pictures in squares? No. Okay, I don't use Instagram. You, you can square off, but he's talking about professional pictures. They're not, Yeah. they're not his like cell phone pictures. They're it's actual, anything. They're actual it's photography. Well, it's anything out of his catalog, which does. Well, yeah, does I'm sure that people aren't buying prints of his friggin' dinner. Yeah, probably not. Although there are a lot of foodies out there. Um, one thing he told his followers, I swear I will never, never sell anything this cheap again. So if you're interested, send a screenshot of the photos and I'll send you a PayPal invoice, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Forbes magazine looked into this and apparently he had $40 in his, in his checking account the day before he made the announcement and $15,000 in his account after all of the invoices had gotten paid, which just blows my mind, but... I guess it works. I mean, he got. Yeah, if you, if you have the product, you have the the need. It's really the desperation part, but that's kind of interesting. It's yeah. the publicity. The, the I, I don't know if he'll ever be able to. from that is. Yeah, that, that'll be good. And that'll help him. But I don't know if he could pull something like that off again. I, I wouldn't see why he couldn't. I, maybe not exactly like that, but you yeah. can keep selling prints. Oh, I'm sure he can keep selling prints. That's, that's, that's fine. But I don't know if he could be like. Hey, for one day, I'll sell you all my Instagram, you know, blah, blah, blah. But maybe you could. You could sell a print. You know, it's one of yeah. those. You could sell a print of your invoice. <laughs> it's an interesting, it's the process that he used to go about selling the prints is interesting. The yeah. invoicing a screenshot in PayPal. It's like it actually took some. Ingenuity. Yeah, it took a little bit of thinking to figure out how you'd actually do that. The screenshot yeah. thing is kind of interesting. Yeah, that actually, that, that actually, well, I mean, how else do you tell somebody which Instagram photo do you want? Exactly. I mean, that, that, makes, that makes total sense, actually, when you think about it that way. It's like, I want picture number blah, 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 blah. I don't even know. If, you yeah, can't really identify Instagram doesn't quite work that way. Yeah. So, Very yeah. Cool. It is actually a, a really cool use for Instagram. I'm actually curious if they're going to say anything like, hey, you made money off of us. No? No. So a judge strike down a six-year-old FAA drone ban on commercial drone use in the U.S. So if you didn't catch this news piece, the FAA had been prosecuting people, and still still is, uh, with a large fine for operating commercial drones, especially in videography and commercial video shoots. Uh, this, the particular case was a Swiss drone operator was $10,000 fine levied. Uh, the FAA was unsuccessful where a judge threw out their fine, which has big implications for people being able to run without being so worried about this commercial drones in videography. Uh, yep. For filmmaking and everything, the drone market and the drone operating is only getting bigger, and this is a big deal. It's it's, it's a win. Yeah, I mean, I know the the FAA was talking about some pilot zones where they were gonna like let people test this out, and uh, apparently, the National Transportation Safety Board judge who stepped in basically said, uh, "Guys, you don't have a law that says you can't fly drones," and that's a big deal for for this industry. I know. I know, I, I know this is important to you. I know at one point you were talking about looking at doing drone, you know, even just, just a short little drone shot for like weddings and stuff. And in theory, well, the FAA still thinks it's illegal. They're they're still fighting it. But you know, you could have been charged ten grand just to make that thirty second video clip for a wedding, and that's 
and, and had a felony on your record. And that, that's just, that, yeah, I'm glad that the, this judge struck this down because this is going to be a big deal because this is really a big emerging market for this. Yes, I mean, the FAA said they are going to appeal this decision, but hopefully it, it sticks. I think it will. I, I really, I think it will. Either that or they're going to have to write a new law and the whole regulatory process with that, they'll have to write a new law. It'll have to go out for comment. They'll get so much negative press on it that they'll decide not to make the law, and it's not, they're never going to make this law stick. It's going to get shot down so quick if they ever try to actually I, I change whatever it was they were claiming to have gone by into an actual rule or law or whatever the FAA gets to do. It's, I don't think they'll, they'll make it stick. These last two weeks, uh, we've been, well, I've been shooting. Ryan helped out a little bit early on. Um, you know, as, as part of the, the whole Bucket Castle photo uh, YouTube channel, we were also going to do a number of educational videos and some fun videos and some other things. And what we've been shooting and editing for the last week, 10 days, two weeks, uh, is the crash course in the exposure triangle. Uh, this was originally supposed to be a crash course on how to use your DSLR. I was like completely committed to this idea of a 20 minute video that explains all the cool functions on your DSLR and, and then as we were shooting it, it became quite, quite uh, apparent that that was not going to work. Um, I had a script, I had everything else. Uh, I am not a film person, I'm a photographer. Uh, this became, a, a, yeah, thanks for that look. Um, this became abundantly clear when people started looking at, at what I wanted to do and told me I was crazy. Um, it's all crazy. Well, yeah. Nothing wrong with crazy. Nothing wrong with crazy. They're telling you nothing uh, because it's crazy. But but we got um, we we got a wonderful model up here, Jessica. She she's blast to work with. Hope to get her in here for some other videos. Um, and we had a lot of fun, and we shot it on the on the sixty and the seventy two hundred because I took the Rebel out. You know, took the old T two I out because it. I wanted to show as we're going through everything how all the settings changed. And how it actually, you know, you can talk about the exposure triangle with aperture and exposure and your ISO speed all you want, but until you actually see how everything works around the triangle, it really, it, it doesn't really click for a lot of people. I had never heard that phrase before you started talking about it. The exposure triangle? I've, I've been, like, in college, not photography college, but at, like, College courses that are based were based film photography courses, and I never actually I don't know, that's heard a, the phrase. I don't think. I think I learned the phrase from my mom when I was first learning to shoot, and she took a number of photography courses in college. And maybe it's an old term it's that nobody's an extremely using. Extremely old term, I think. But it, it's if somebody has any thoughts about that? Yeah, if you have thoughts about that, or if you've heard it, or heard something else that it's called, let us know. You know, comments down below. I, I like that. Uh, it works. Yeah, it works really well, and it makes for some nice graphics when you're when you're trying to explain things. Uh, but I had, I grabbed you know I grabbed the Rebel and because it blows out differences much more quickly. It's not subtle when you start changing things, especially the ISO speed, um, which was the big draw to to grabbing that. Um, so I grabbed the Rebel and I, I threw on my my little Nifty Fifty, and we started having fun. We we started you know in each each direction of the triangle. We started with the absolute darkest, ran it up to the lightest. And you could actually see where, where the differences are and, and what trade-offs you have to make. And it's a, it's, hopefully when it edits together, it'll be a real good video. I felt pretty good about it when we, uh, when we were shooting it. And should be good. It should be pretty good. Uh, so, like I said, I, I took out the, the Nifty 50. This is a, which is the, one of the two names. The other is the Plastic Fantastic, depending on where in the world you are. Um, if you're... In Australia, they tend to call it the Plastic Fantastic. We call it the Nifty 50 here. And it is the Canon 50 millimeter, so it's a prime lens, 1.8 version two. Uh, you can't really probably see it, but maybe, who knows. Um, it's a regular EF mount, indicated by the little red dot. And Ryan's gonna take my lens and play with it. Um, it is a great little lens, and the reason I picked that because I was going for as many extremes as I could in that video, was because the, the Rebel's ISO compensation is horrible, so as you get up beyond even 16, I, I hate shooting that thing above 400, but you get up above 1600, and the pictures are almost unusable from the low light compensation. And then you get the 50 here is a 1.8, so you can open the aperture way up. I mean, you just go, and, uh, and so since you can open it way up, you can actually see some extreme 
on there too, and and I think I'm. You having fun? Yeah. All right. Um, and so that, that let me have you know let me show a lot more options than you know say using the kit lens, because you're much more limited. I mean, when it's a four oh five six. Oh yeah. On the kit lens, you really couldn't you know dial it in nearly as far as to see because you don't really start seeing huge amounts of depth of field difference until you get way lower. Yeah, these distances, the, the 1.8, you really need to, you need yeah. a lot of depth of field difference to be able to see in a video like that. Yeah, so we were able to do that. And so that, that gave me what I was looking for. Plus, I just love this lens. Yeah. And it's a great little lens for shooting pretty much everything. It's an okay portrait lens. I think it's the focal's a little short for shooting portraits. So it's, like, I've, I've always, the 50 millimeter portrait thing is very interesting. I've always, the subject really determines the, the whether or not a 50 millimeter yeah. will work. There's some subjects that work really beautifully in 50 millimeter focal length. There's, there's I, some obviously tons of great portraits of 50 millimeter. I, I really lucked out that Jessica does look very good in yeah. 50 millimeter. Um, so it's the 50 millimeter is is a very it's one of those lenses you need to own it just yeah. as in the bag. Whether you're just buying a, a new DSLR, it's your first DSLR, or you're still a professional photographer with a lot of pro glass. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's one of the first three lenses people ever purchase because they're cheap and they're for the money they give you a, a lot of power for that money. Yeah, I mean the, the the reason it's called the Plastic Fantastic is it is. I mean, if you ever go get one, pick it up, play with it at the camera store. If you don't buy it, I'll I'll be ashamed. Um, it is light because it's mostly plastic. It's not a magnesium alloy. It's not a heavy, you know, dense ABS plastic. I mean, it's a regular old plastic, but it takes some abuse. And it's light, and it's little. I mean, it's 50 millimeters, uh, but it's 99 bucks new. If they're charging you more than that, find a better camera store. It, I've seen them as low as 40 bucks used in, in okay condition, 60 in really good condition, and it's a great lens to have. And since you know, on the on the Canon side, it's an EF mount, so you can mount it on your Rebel, you can mount it on your Pro body. It, it'll work on both. It's the same on Nikon. The Nikon yeah. 518D yeah. is uh, the same thing. It's, yeah. It worked worked just fine on my D600. Yeah. So. Was it G? No, D. I don't know. It's one of those. So many letters in camera lenses these days. Well, the difference days. between those two isn't really anything. It was just yeah. like an upgraded model, I think. Yeah. I think it's the, the D now. All right. See, we just get marks. It's Mark II. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, it so researching gear, uh, there was a question I had as far as macro focal length and what the real practical difference is between the different macro focal lengths and why you need a higher focal length for a macro lens. So focal length is the distance from your subject. So the macro lens, when you're at your maximum, your maximum magnification, the smaller the focal length, the closer you end up being to your subject. So for me, if I'm looking at a macro lens, the longer the lens, the better it's going to be. So you have more light, more space for sliding, more space for you working around from your subject. So Tom uses... So you, what you really meant by doing research was you saw I have a 50 millimeter macro in the closet no, and you this went... Is, this is well before I was looking at <laughs> millimeter macros and seeing 200 millimeter macros and 60 millimeter macros and wondering whether the 60 millimeter was enough or distance or not. All right, well, I have my, my 50 millimeter. It's a, a 50 millimeter F2.5, which seems like a weird frame, you know, a weird, weird uh, aperture stop, but it does work. The camera always recognizes it. It just sees it as one step below 2.8, which makes perfect sense. Although on anything else, it's it would jump to 2.2. Two. Two. Yeah, it is a, it's a third stop drop. Um, I, honestly, I have the 50 because I got it at a reasonable price, but I also mostly shoot it on shooting miniatures, on the, the little miniature wargaming models that, that people have at the temple. And for that, I don't care if I'm this close to it. You know, I, I, I could be this far away, I could be here. My, my focal length on this is something like around six inches. I mean, it's tiny, I get right up on it. And I do have the obnoxious little LED ring light that I can put, it mounts onto this lens. So the amount of light I need to get in is actually pretty minimal because I can generate light right here. Um, I have shot on a 100 millimeter macro. I, I totally understand why you would want to shoot on a 100 millimeter macro. You don't have to be right on top of it. You can be a little away and still get all of that crisp, fine detail. 
Um, it was also much better glass than this. Though this is a very nice lens. It does take some very good pictures. Yeah, so the professional, if you're shooting macro or using commercial macro stuff, you're yeah. looking at a 200 millimeter macro. That's yeah, they're that, wildly expensive, but they allow you a lot of working distance between you and your subject for lighting. Yeah, I know the uh, one of the food photographers I've worked with. Uh, I, the guy's amazing, but he just he's got the 200 millimeter macro, and it looks like I, I don't. It, it looks like a regular telephoto, like it's giant, it's huge, but he can be this far away, you know, he can be 18 inches away from the food and get every wonderful detail at an insanely high aperture. I mean, just, you know, he, he can run it anywhere from like 2.8, he does most, I asked him, he does most of his shots at 5.6 just because he wants some depth before it fades out in the back. I was like, that's actually pretty cool. So, but yeah, no, I, I can see why you would want, especially where you, when you're doing weddings, you'd want, you don't want to get right on top of something all the time. And I don't care because I'm shooting minis and people are letting me get right up in there and I have time for those shots. So the 50 doesn't bother me. I would love to get the 100 after I shot with it. Uh, yeah, that'd be my, I need, I need that glass. That's um, my 100 millimeter Nikkor is my next, Yeah. is up there with my next purchases. Yeah, for me, 100 millimeter macro is mm, cash money and don't have it. <laughs> Nikon isn't cheap either, but no, it's it's actually significantly more expensive. I think you can purchase a sixty millimeter for like three hundred and something dollars at one to one magnification or one to one sensor reproduction, whatever however you call it. Yep. Um, the hundred millimeter new Nikkor is eight hundred dollars and change, eight thirty something. That's not so bad. It's a lot of. I mean, compare it to my seventy. It's a two hundred. Yeah. It's for Nikkor for Nikkor. That's a pretty expensive lens. Yeah, no, that, that is quite an expensive lens. I guess the Canon, the Canon market, everything is just a thousand dollars more expensive. I, I, I live with my decisions. I, I'm not saying <laughs> it won't be the other way around in ten years, but it goes back and forth. But always. Well, when I when I started buying Nikon, it was cheaper. Yeah. I mean, more expensive. It was more expensive, yeah. It was more expensive. It was the knowingly the more expensive option, and I still went that way. Yeah. I mean, you go with you go with what you're comfortable with. I just happen to like the way Canons work. Grew up on my little Canon knockoff, and my first digital was a Canon. I'm gonna stick with it. I'm not saying you need to be a brand loyalist because things change. But it's and things loyalist. are going to change. They, they're gonna change. I mean, I like shooting on your Nikon. There, there are features about it I like better. And there's, but I just feel a little faster shooting on my Canon. That's all. Yeah, it's it's just being comfortable with things. My yeah. father, my father had a his first DSLR was a Nikon D50. So I, I use that quite a bit, and I that's where I got DSLRs. But yep. yeah, all right. So recently, I sent in my D six hundred for repair. Uh, Nikon has sent out a an open service call for D six hundreds due to the oil spotting and the the shutter issue, which is a known issue, which they didn't admit to right away. This comes on the heels of multiple class action lawsuits that were filed on both you know a different plaintiffs' behalfs by law firms. Those are all online. You can find the class action lawsuits, read them through, and see all the testimonials, all this sort of thing. Nikon is paying shipping, paying shipping both ways, and replacing shutter, cleaning sensors, updating firmware, making the D600 as good as it can be, sending it back. I have a, a co-worker of mine, a fellow wedding photographer, sent in his pair of D600s. They were back in seven days or so. They go out to, from us in New England, they go out to Melville, New York, and back very quickly. This is interesting. It's the lawsuit is is a big big lawsuit. It states a lot about the problem, how it was misrepresented. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how far it's going to go, whether they're going to win, lose, lose a lot of money on it. Don't know, but they're fixing the problem. So that's it's a big thing for Nikon. Yeah. How quickly do they come out with the the six ten after that? Six ten was a year. Six ten was a year. That, almost of the day. That's, that's that's actually part of the lawsuit. Is it's obvious that that was the fix and that was a de depreciation of. That the 600s value yep. when it was just a fix that should have been applied to 600s in the first place. Yeah, it's an interesting equipment thing. Yeah, it, it, I mean that that's one of those things I've never seen. I mean, I, you see a lot of camera bodies come out, and, and, but at different grades at different times. You never really see the successor come out that quick after, and that that it wasn't really a successor. That's that's well, the thing. It was a it's a hot fix. It's a, it's yeah. a slight upgrade. So yeah, making a camera that's not a successor like that is kind of obvious it's not yeah i mean if i i mean what the 6d came out in 
2012. If the 6D Mark II was already out, we'd probably be looking at the same issue on the Canon side. So, yeah. Must have been so, so does it feel dirty to be only working on two Canon cameras this week? No? You know I don't care. <laughs> I know you don't care. It's just more expensive. Yeah. But they're still here. <laughs> if you enjoy our little weekly chats and little ribbings we give one another and and you want to show some thumbs up, uh, you can always find us uh, here, right here on the Bucket Castle Photo uh, YouTube channel here. Make sure you subscribe and let us know that you want us to keep making videos. Like, comment, share. Like, comment, share. Um, you can find me over on Facebook at Aperture to Pixels Photography and Ryan at Peace Point Photography. It's peacepointphoto.com or Peace Point Photo on Facebook, which everyone does. Yeah, everyone does the Facebook or ApertureToPixels.com. Uh, they cross-link all over the place. And if you have any comments, questions, you want to, you want to, you want us to talk about something in particular, you want us to not talk about something in particular, we'll totally ignore that option and talk about it anyway. And make sure you leave us some comments below and give us some love, man. <laughs>